Hello everyone. Uh, <clears throat> let's start with some good news. I'm not the speaker on the session. Um, <clears throat> we have a bit of a better speaker for you. Uh, but I just quickly wanted to uh, make a small introduction. Uh, I'm Kurt Blatteo. I'm the track chair for the Content Strategy track. Uh, first one ever at DrupalCon Europe. Um, <clears throat> so how are we finding Barcelona so far? Everything okay? Good place for an event, isn't it? It's actually such a good place that last year we had uh, CONFAB, one of the biggest events when it comes to content strategy, also hosted in Barcelona. And I'm a Barcelona local, but I missed it. I missed it because I was at DrupalCon Amsterdam, which was happening in the same week, which is kind of a pity, but hey, I wanted to be with the Drupal community, you know? Um, there was one content strategy talk at DrupalCon Amsterdam, one out of 90-something sessions. And the session got cancelled because I think the speaker lost his flight or something. It was replaced by something about accessibility. So I went back to the office, wrote this giant rant on the corporate blog saying, how can the Drupal community forget about content strategy altogether? It's one of the biggest trends when it comes to web communication, and we're just doing as if it's not happening or if it's not important. So a couple of months ago, I got a phone call from the Drupal Association saying, hey, if you really think that we're not doing a good job, why don't you do it yourself? So I got commissioned by finding some excellent speakers uh, to speak at a dedicated content strategy track, which is hooray, but then at the same time, okay, but now where can I find these people? And we all know uh, people that are quite vocal in that sphere in the Drupal community, people like Jeff Eaton that everybody has seen or heard speaking. Um, but I thought, let's try to find somebody uh, with a bit more of a, you know, a local thought leader, if you want. So I started looking around and didn't have to look very far because uh, one of the people, that, one of the thought leaders that we know quite well uh, in Europe is uh, Nas Urbina. Uh, he's the author of the book uh, Content Strategy, Connecting the Dots Between, and no need to quickly peek, between business brand and benefits. Um, probably many people have uh, read or seen uh, the book. So he's also a quite well-known uh, speaker when it comes to content strategy e events. So uh, he's quite an authority out there. Uh, being as we are at a DrupalCon event, it might be that not for everybody in the room uh, he's that well-known, but believe me, it's a really opportunity to uh, see and hear him, him speak. So uh, apart from being an, being an author of uh, a great book, which I actually use quite often in my work, um, Noz also has his own consultancy, so sure if, if people have business inquiry, he will not be angry if you contact him. Uh, so yeah, I'll disappear very quickly from stage so you, you can uh, listen and learn from him like many of us content strategists have already done so in the past. All yours. Thank you very much, Kuhn. Thank you everybody, uh, everybody for coming. Um, you heard a little bit of introduction there. I will do a brief little bit on my background as well. My name is Nazar Bina, and I'm doing the non-terrifying intro to semantic content. So you got the, you got the key stats from Kuhn. Um, I'm a content strategist in, and modeler. I have spent about 14 years in, in the content world. Uh, specifically in the semantic and structured content world, which is what kind of what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, the role of semantic and structured content in the market has changed significantly since I started. It's kind of been, um, you know, uh, an uphill battle for a decade and a half, and then about 24 months ago, suddenly life became suddenly life became much, much, much easier. Um, and we're going to talk about what's happening in the market and why that is. I like to say that I'm an H to H, that is a human to human, because most of my projects have been in um, you know, business to business, microchips, medical devices, uh, technology products. I like to say that I'm a masochist, so I take the big painful problems that no one else wants to kind of deal with. So, uh, but I do come to those clients, even if you're selling brain scanners or, or, or microchips, and I tell them, you still have a lot to learn from business to consumer. And business consumer has a lot to learn from uh, business to business and multinationals because even small business to consumer businesses are going global and they're trying to sell at scale. And the internet is 
a scale operation. And simultaneously, uh, there, in business to business, we're realizing that relationship building, branding, um, personalized communications are all just as important when you're selling to a, um, a procurement team as it is when you're selling to an individual. Okay, so today we're going to go through trends in the market, fixing our content with semantic models, and then what to do next. So some, some tips and some take-homes for you to go and apply this in your work. Before I get any further, I will point out that I'm used to working in uh, conferences that are more of a mix between the actual brands and the agencies and service providers, whereas DrupalCon is much more kind of the industry and the service providers talking amongst themselves. So you may see me kind of slip on that a little bit, but I am going to talk to you as my colleagues, uh, as service providers. But this is for you to kind of take these messages home to your clients so you can get bigger, more interesting projects, and they can get more benefit out of what you provide. So the big picture. I like to start with a kind of a big context thing here. Uh, I like to talk a lot about the idea of content karma. When we're talking about content, uh, the more real value we give to consumers, the more value that will come back our way. The internet and communication and sales and marketing have uh, evolved significantly in the last 20 years. And what we're moving to is from a world of publishers putting out their message and trying to persuade consumers to the engagement model, where we're trying to build ongoing relationships with people, um, accelerated by social media to be able to have a, uh, a back and forth with our consumer. And as we progress into uh, platforms that can provide us more and more communications capability, our audience becomes more and more resistant to those communications. So we're seeing things like the discussion of the death of the banner ad. We're seeing discussing discussion of the death of traditional advertising period. Uh, all because people are becoming more and more resistant to any sort of commercial or self-interested message. So organizations are realizing they have to be more customer-centric and focus more on how they can deliver uh, appropriate and relevant value to consumers rather than just kind of showing, showing off with celebrity endorsements and pretty branding and, and awesome logo design. We have to really deliver substance and value if we want to get value back. But we have to do that on a, a huge number of channels. So the more we can make our content adaptive, the more we can re realistically deliver tailored, high-value content without running out of budget, resources, or time. So this talk at the highest level is we've got a huge diversity of audiences with a big diversity of, of interests and needs. So how do we give them all uh, a personalized, relevant experience on the device of their choosing without completely going out of business? So I'm going to look at... Um, the difference between a search result today versus even five years ago. So uh, there's a supermarket called Asda. It's a supermarket in the UK where I do a lot of my work. And uh, Sutton is a city in the UK. So if we come up to the top here, if I have a mouse, we've got what time does Asda Sutton close? So what time does a local supermarket close? Five years ago, if I put that into Google, I would have gotten a list of links. It would have given me different uh, pages based on their keyword ranking for the, for, the, for the terms that I put in, and then I could go on those pages and go get my answer. Now I get that in the browser. That's not a web page. That's an answer to my question. That's what I actually wanted as a user. We all make something web-related, web pages, or some part of the web page um, machinery if we're at this conference. But funny enough, people don't actually want web pages. Websites and web pages are not interesting. People don't go online for the purposes of finding web pages. They go online to have experiences, to connect with other people, to satisfy some need or answer some kind of question. So the more we focus on what they're actually going on for, the more success we'll have, the more value we'll bring to them. So here, the, the web is not a series of indexed pages which people can go and read. They're not passive. They are proactive systems that deliver the right dose of information to the right person. And they do that by leveraging metadata. So the rest of this talk is essentially about metadata and how you can do it too. People are asking all sorts of natural language, non 
keyword term based questions. You know, how to, how to get one of X? Where should I go on vacation? In the business to business world, I'm on a factory shop floor and there's a machine that's not working. So what troubleshooting is needed for this machine that has these modules installed that's at this point in its maintenance cycle? I'm evaluating a new circuit board to integrate into my product. So does this have the specs that I want? Does it have the operating parameters? How is it better than this other one that I might use? And they're answering more natural language questions and much more complex questions uh, than they used to. As the, the web gets more sophisticated, we actually get simpler in how we use it. Um, we expect more from it, so we just talk to it like a person. And we want to give very targeted, very specific answers to all these kinds of questions. But we want to do that targeting on this endless plethora of devices. So we, you know, we've lived through the, the movement from the desktop web to the mobile web. Uh, we have the Internet of Things coming out. We have one of my personal favorites, which is wearable technologies and the ability to augment the, the real world around us with digital overlays of content. So the role of the web page is changing. We're moving from managing web pages to managing digital content that may or may not exist in pages. So how do we manage the same answer to a question that might, on one case, uh, be delivered out as a web page, but in another case be read into someone's ears through text-to-speech? -text Brands are starting to ask this question because they want to be able to deliver answers on all these different uh, device formats and channels. 94% of businesses also not only want to do all these channels, but they're saying they want to personalize the response. So where are you? What time is it? Do you have a purchase history with me? Have I never seen you before? Is it raining where you are? All these things are actual questions that have come up with me with clients. So they want to do promotions or communications that are based on ambient geographic or weather or situational uh, data for the people in that location or they want to personalize based on what they've seen you click on, where you came in from in terms of URLs, what other queries you've done uh, on their site or off-site. So personalization is big business. 48% of shoppers would like to use a phone to shop while in stores. So I use this as an example to remind us that we can kind of create these user experiences on a website, but what is the context in which that website is being used? So the consumers are, are telling the retailers, we want to be able to use the web as a physical guide while we're walking through a physical environment. But not enough designers are thinking about those two scenarios. How do, I, how do I get answers while sitting at home? How do I get more relevant answers when I'm standing there right in front of the product and I have a sales agent um, five meters away from me? 74% of shoppers who show room are older than 29, 48% are older than 40. So when we talk about this um, combined digital physical uh, purchasing process, we kind of think automatically of hip and trendy millennial shoppers on smartphones. That's not actually accurate. You don't have to be 21 to realize that if you walk into a store, get to actually touch the product, then go home and buy it on Amazon, that's just a smart way to shop. You don't have to be a young, hip and savvy person because you'll quickly figure out that I can actually see what I, what I want and get the benefits of the physical experience, then get the benefits of the digital experience back home. So everybody is doing this, regardless of age. Uh, so this isn't up and coming. This is very present for any generation. How do we optimize for crossover, uh, contextual, mixed environment, mixed device experiences? And then it's not a business consumer thing either. I use lots of consumer examples because we can all relate to them. But 66% of B2B suppliers say customer expectations are driving them towards omnichannel. So customers don't expect great website, crappy print materials. They don't expect great pre-sales materials, crappy post-sales materials. If you communicate to me as a brand, then your website, your print materials, your pre-sales, your post-sales, your training, all of that has got to be working together as one face of the company. So although your businesses will be in the support of the web and digital channel, ask the questions. You know, how does this integrate with all of these other touch points? Have you thought about that? 
It's a way to differentiate yourself as a supplier, and if you're a brand, they know that it's a way to differentiate themselves to their customers. If they can tie all of these different channels together and deliver a unified experience, then they are going to be more successful than their competitors. All these different pressures, all these different trends, I think, are leading us to what I call the smartening, a new era where we are really looking at not only what data we're creating and what content we're creating, but metadata. This is the first great age of metadata. We have to fix the content that we're creating. And what that means is making it format agnostic. There's a lot of, there was a lot of work done in the last five to 10 years about writing for the web. Now there's a new trend of writing for everywhere. This is, uh, uh, Kuhn mentioned that I was at Confab. Christina Halverson, who's heard of Christina Halverson? Okay, so Christina Halverson is one of the big thought leaders in content, and she kind of got the term content strategy and um, content strategy for the web popularized. It was around for probably a decade before, but she was really kind of a watershed author. And she wrote that book, Content Strategy for the Web. Now, I think about seven years later, she just released Content Strategy for Everything. Because we don't have to write for the web anymore, we have to write for all of the different ways that our message could appear. And as digital content managers and digital content solution providers, we have to be designing for all the ways that that content could appear, not just for the web page, not just for the web experience. So we have to be ignoring the format of output and worrying about the message itself. To be able to deliver that personalization, we need to be able to take all of our little pieces of content and break them up into components, which we can then put together automatically or dynamically to give the impression that we're giving a fresh, personalized answer to every individual. And we're going to need a lot of semantic metadata. Semantic metadata that defines the content and describes the content. So what is it? And also, who's it for? When should it be shown? What context is it relevant for? Uh, and as well as audience, applicability, and context metadata to decide when and where to route it. So when should we filter out this content? When should we show that content? And, and I am really talking at a much more detailed level than I think some of you will have worked before. So I'll show you some examples. So what does fixing the content look like? We're going to go through some key concepts. Component content versus traditional content, metadata, content models, semantic versus structured. This should be controversial. Taxonomy and linked data. So I, I mentioned we want to break up the content. So when we break up into format-free components, we go from managing um, you know, our PDF downloads and our weighted pages to smaller modules, each with their own structure. What that does is it changes in a content management system our unit of use from documents or pages to components and then things that make up components, which we would call fragments or even variables. So if we're talking about a blog post, was our unit of use before, what is the structure of a blog post? What are the things that I can reuse from other deliverables and put into the middle of a blog post and just plonk them in there? Kind of like a content image, in the sense that we, you know, we take an image, we take it from our image library, we slap it in. Why can't we do that with text? Why can't we have an anchor link that points to a, a table or a bullet list? This concept of we're going to take these little pieces of text and bring them together in more complex ways if we model them and structure them properly. So we're going to go deep, deep, deep into the content and start breaking it into smaller and smaller components. And that's what gives us the term component content management, which some of you will probably heard. Uh, there is a big movement towards this space right now. A lot of the big content management pr providers are either becoming component content management systems or saying that they're becoming co component content management systems. This, this uh, componentization gives us what I call modularity. Well, well, I shouldn't say I call. What is called modularity. The point of this is that we are moving to having a bunch of web pages to having a pool of modular components where we can pull out a certain set of components and deliver them for scenario A or for scenario B or scenario C from the same common pool. 
the different scenarios could be different devices. So you could be talking about, I'm going to pull this out for delivery on the desktop web, or I'm going to pull it out for delivery in an app. Or they could be different people. This is a new customer. This is an existing customer. This is an existing customer who has registered to our premium service. And deliver them the right package of components, regardless of device or location they've asked. Also, if we do things like define a number of components as, a, as an assembly, we can then reuse whole assemblies. So if I'll give you an example of this, I've got clients who want to be able to do um, a product overview brochure. And they want to be able to take then seven product overview brochures, wrap them up, and deliver that as an offline ebook catalog. So we've got, instead of delivering to the web, we've actually packaged that up and put it through InDesign to make a, a nice, proper print quality PDF with print quality graphics and so on and so on. But they only define the set of modules that makes up a brochure once. And then regardless of channel or output, they can just take that and say, okay, that was uh, um, a brochure that was uh, making a little microsite, and now it's a, it's a PDF for an ebook reader. Once you've got all these little bits, once you've got all these components, you, you need metadata. So you, you all know what metadata is, I'm assuming, at DrupalCon. Yeah? So you've all heard data about data. But there, I think there's more to it now. And I'm going to show you some of the different uses of metadata. So metadata is everything about the content um, in it and around it that describes the content. So what I like to, talk, what I like to say about metadata is it's what you use to stitch back together all the little components once you've broken them apart. Because you're not going to manually reassemble all these things and manually define all these different relationships again once you've broken all the content into little pieces. You have to use metadata to, to enable automation. The question is where to put it. At what level? How much of it? So we started with documents. Back in the day, we had our, our document or our PDF or deliverable, and we could put different metadata on that. So if we had different audience tags, we could tag it as being for her, or for him, or for mobile display, or for USB gadget buyers, or whatever our metadata flags were. And we could put that at the info product level. But once we've done our breaking up into components, we've got all these little bits of content running around. And so now they all need metadata too. So um, we can have a whole module like an entire blog post or a whole product overview. We can have assemblies like um, an entire brochure. And the content for a brochure might form the part of the navigation of a site, but it also might break off on its own and form the navigation of a single um, brochure output. But then we've also got smaller bits of, of content which we want to manage. So a single paragraph. Uh, an obvious example would be a note or a legal disclaimer. But it can also be you know, a reusable paragraph from, from a product line that actually appears on several products pages. Or inline, individual tags. Um, I've had projects where authors wanted to be able to write content and then they were, they were talking about boats. And they were writing about these boats, but the boats are in motion. So they wanted to be able to talk about the boat, and then in line in the sentence when they were talking about the boat, its current location, when they mentioned the location, would be up to date with its current actual location. So as they wrote, they would, and they would mention the location of the boat, or the amount of cargo it was carrying, or how fast it was going, or all sorts of things about the boat. And every time they said something like that, they would drop in a reference to a web service that was providing that data in real time. So every time you looked at the page, all the inline references would be talking about that boat at that moment in time when you loaded the page. So we, have to, we can be managing very tiny little bits of information. Another obvious one is product names or model numbers. As you will probably have experienced, product names are kind of a random, wishy-squishy thing that marketing may decide to change at a whim. So I've had clients who, in one case, they were running around and manually finding every place they mentioned that product name or that model number. Other clients who had already gone through the mi migration to this kind of content 
they were able to change a couple of variables and the whole site um, and the print documentation just refreshed itself. We can do this with tagging. We can do this with short codes. Um, I'm sorry, did I just use a WordPress term? Sorry. <laughs> we can do this with kind of um, hacks or workarounds or kind of, uh, little techniques like that. But if we're just kind of giving all this power to the users, as you will well know, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And we don't want to enable people to just tag and mark up as they want. We have to have an underlying logic um, that's guiding this and controlling when and where and how metadata is applied. All that um, guidance is what we call the content model. So we come back to our example here. How did we do that? Um, and this example really works, by the way. Um, for some of you in the audience, it may actually be quite obvious. But take this example, show it to clients. I've had this work as an aha moment. You can't believe how many times. Um, so we've got my, uh, my answer in the web page. And clients go, I want to do that for my customers. So I, so I say, fine, you want to do that for your customers. The implication then is on the back end, somewhere, there's a structural content model. Someone has defined everything that makes up uh, a store. And then, once they've made those rules and said that a store, that a store, is that flashing? <laughs> that a store has um, not only the content that we write in paragraphs and headings, but it also has a specific location, which is defined in a specific way with city and town, uh, and an hours and a schedule. We can then tell everyone, go create the store content. And they can create well-tagged, machine-readable re descriptions of a store. And then map that out to, for example, schema.org metadata. Who knows schema.org already? OK, so that should have been 100% of the room. Schema.org is an international standard for shipping metadata out with HTML. So HTML used to be the place that metadata went to die. Once you're in HTML, all the good, meaningful data smarts was gone, and you just had titles and headings and Ps and, and ULs and all this stuff, which is useless to machines. So with schema.org, you're going to have persistent metadata, which lives on out into the public web, where your tools or third-party tools, or for example, Google, can reach in and pull out that specific answer. Because it can identify the part of the content, which is the store name, its location, and its hours, and construct an answer. So that is um, semantic metadata in its most common popular sense. People then ask me, why did you define any kind of model internally why do we have to have a semantic model? Why do we have structures? Why can't we just write in schema.org directly? And the point of this is not so that we can satisfy Google and schema.org. We want to be able to publish to something that, that Google and search engines um, will be able to scrape, but our metadata is about our products. It's according to our business processes and the way that our customers want to do things. Some of that will overlap with schema.org. Some of it won't. So you are defining the model and the metadata structures for your business and what your customers want to experience, not what schema.org wants and not what schema.org supports. So we don't want to write specifically for them. We want to write for us. It's, for me, I make compares, compare it to when we started writing for search engines. We are trying to game them and write search engine-friendly text instead of user-friendly text. Same thing. We're not designing schema.org metadata. We're designing our business's metadata and then mapping to schema.org when necessary. So you put all those together, and you have what we call intelligent content. There's an intelligent content conference that I, have, uh, that I speak at on a regular basis. Um, and the reason, I like the term intelligent content. Um, schema.org is not a very friendly name to anybody outside this room. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee says linked data. I don't think that content people like the term data. I don't, like, I don't think they like having their content referred to as data. So intelligent content is a much more friendly name, and it's actually a much more human name. This is, again, an example that I use. And I use very graphical examples, and I invite you to do this with your clients. Take their content and show them the intelligence behind it. So reverse engineer it. 
what we do is we take all these different bits and we ask them, what do you think those are? And in this case, based on layout and formatting, people can usually guess. Like within a few minutes, I can get any group of over five people to predict what's going to be on my slide. They're going to say product name, tagline. They're going to say the, point out the feature list. Um, there are going to be some discrepancies, but we all kind of get this. And we all kind of get this because we're familiar with it. We've kind of grown up now, or we've used the web enough to figure out where these things are, even if we can't read the text. Because we understand the intelligence behind it, the logic behind it. And it's very simple. We've got our product overview, our product name, model number, and so on and so on. And so this is uh, a way for you to bring the idea of structure and models back to clients and say, your content already has structures and models. What we're trying to do here is document that and implement that in the content management system so the content management system understands your content structure and models. Because once the content management system understands it, then we can manipulate it and reuse it and componentize it and do all this fancy stuff. But we want to get that model established and um, agreed and so everybody can work against it. Not only will your content management system be more consistent in itself, then authors become more consistent. Um, has anyone read Jeff Eaton's Battle for the Body Field? No. Good article. Jeff Eaton, uh, really great guy, um, one of the biggest advocates of this in the Drupal community. And he wrote this article called Battle for the Body Field where he's talking about semantics inside um, the body. Because as we know, you've got your nice field control data where you can control the metadata, and then you get to this body field, and then users go nuts. And they put whatever kind of junk in there. So the body field is somewhere where we can, we can now start to go in more detail and put in more guidance and more control. Not to create a kind of like super form hideous experience, but something that has this metadata around single words, around single bullet items. I like to say there's no reason that when we write a feature in a list of features, it becomes a list item. It's a feature in a feature list. So we should tag it as a feature in a feature list, not tag it as uh, uh, an LI in a UL. We want to keep that intelligence and keep the human intelligence even when we write it down. Once we do that, all our content becomes more consistent because our, our authors are more constrained and they're better guided. And then your consumers get benefits because with more cons consistent content going out, they can read more easily. They can scan more easily. They understand your content better because it's more consistent within itself. And that makes them happier. As beings, we like consistency. Uh, you saw the keynote hopefully this morning. I really enjoyed that. I'm also a big cognitive science and psychology person when it comes to web content. And I say we are sense-making machines. I'll give you an example. Oh. Yeah, OK. So I've got a diagram here. Can anyone tell me what my diagram is of? OK. Now? Anybody? Yeah, it's a face. Obviously, it's a face. So duh, yeah. But it's really, really not a face. Well, there's a hell of a lot more information on the right than there is on the left. But there's, you would have to actually have a serious brain injury not to recognize that as a face. As beings, we use data compression. Our minds compress and take the fundamentals from the right and match it to the model on the left. All that content models are, all that semantic data is, is taking a simplified model of a complex reality. This isn't about Drupal. It's not about data science. It's about making machines work in a more natural, more human way. This is how we already operate. Um, I've got a whole talk specifically on that called The Biological Imperative for Intelligent Content, which uh, you can check out. And I'm going to go over to here now. OK. Once you've got this, once you've got a nice structured metadata model, you can then use that to interconnect different teams. So we have this rift between UX designers and developers 
and content people. UX designers are creating these beautiful wireframe designs, and then we have to squish this awful, inconsistent, mushy content into it. What we're doing here is we're creating a wireframe for content, and we can map from wireframe to wireframe. And we say, product overview. When we're talking about the product family page, that's where product names go. When we're talking about the desktop product layout, that's where they go. On mobile, that's where they go. And on print, once we've tagged everything up, there's no reason that a print composition engine can't take that same metadata and flow out on a static page which is going to a printer. Same thing with model numbers. Same thing with taglines. Taglines don't go onto the product family page. And again, this, like literally, get screenshots, draw lines, your customers will get it. In way, like I started doing this, and it seems ridiculous, but clients really connect with this. And they go, oh, I understand the connection now between what I wanted and this model in the background, and I can work with it better. What's a bit annoying, though, is once you show them one, they want you to do them for every bloody page and model you have. <laughs> the content model is the backbone of cross-media, adaptive, uh, omni-channel strategies. It future-proofs you so that we've got all these channels handled, and then someone comes out with Microsoft HoloLens, uh, which is what I call the product that Google Glass should have been. And then we say, okay, on Microsoft HoloLens, that's where taglines go. On a lot of these um, augmented reality or card-based displays or social media, you don't have any visual control. You just ship them structured content. You don't get to say what size it is or where it is on the page. The rendering system does that for you. You have to ship them semantically marked up content. So if you want to be future-proofed against all the kinds of delivery that are coming, this is not optional anymore. Because there are, there are systems which are going to ingest your content, whether you like it or not. Or they won't ingest your content, which is even worse. With, when your semantics are explicit, you, uh, in your content, machines can help you reuse, transform, translate, and format. OK. I'm going to go through taxonomy very quickly. So taxonomy is probably one of the easiest ones. In this room, most people are already familiar. So we have our, our taxonomy, our grouping and categorization system. Each value in here is a taxonomy facet. The reason that I'm showing you this is because we want to be able to take our product overview model and then map that to taxonomies. And say we've got a taxonomy um, of values, evaluator, advanced user, sales user. And we want to be able to say, for salespeople, they don't need the feature details on initial load. That's a level two priority for them. Everybody needs the, the top stuff, but for advanced users, they, um, on, they only want the feature name. And for salespeople, they don't want anything except for the key features. So we've written one block of text. And then in the, with the taxonomy, we've said certain parts of our model should go to these people. We could do the same thing with weather. You know, this paragraph was written for to display when it's raining. So we're adding, again, not only a structure, but then categorization to the bits of that structure so we can selectively show these bits or those bits to the, to the different people. Once we've got all that together, we've got content that's marked up in a very granular way. And you get situations where we've got our model and our outputs, and we've got two different short descriptions. In one point of the interface, when the audience is a USB um, gadget buyer, we're going to show the, that short, one short description. But if someone else logs in and the audience is him, then in the exact same place, we will substitute a different piece of content. So semantic content models make your content programmable for maximum reuse and relevance. So you're not loading a page as much as you're running a query with a set of parameters, and that delivers a page according to who that person is and what they want. So I'm coming into the last little bit here, linked data. I mentioned that's Tim Berners-Lee's term for schema.org and these public data standards. I like linked data a lot because it's old. I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I've been doing this for 15 years, and no one cared. No one cared. I was such a niche player 
12 years ago because people created print or they created web. That was it. You know, you need to do a website, so you got a web team. And they copy and pasted all the print stuff onto the website as fast as they could. And it was only once mobile hit, people went, oh, crap, it's happening again. And what if it happens again? And so now that we have the Internet of Things, augmented reality, data feeds, uh, syndication, microsites, apps, people are going, you know what? This isn't stopping. Suddenly I've become a really popular guy because people needed a future-proof methodology for doing this. And so when we talked about OWL, even like 10 years ago, even I thought, I thought OWL was nerd stuff. Now I'm realizing, actually, we do need a standard methodology for describing our stuff that we all agree on. And that's essentially what linked uh, data is. So it's now linked and endorsed, uh, backed and endorsed by people like Google, Facebook, Bing, BBC, and, and so on and so on. And that's what enables this. So we've got our, our store. If you go onto schema.org, you can find out you know, how they did that. There's an opening hour specification for the metadata. And that allows you to do the kind of intelligent display that we talked about. And that's what drives all this fancy stuff that we're seeing all over the place now, where search results are becoming more and more specific, more and more intelligent, because they've got this, this uh, metadata inside them that allows you to render it. So putting it all together, you've got your content, you've got your models, um, you've got your users, You've got your scenarios, the location, a certain event, are they at a wine tasting, a certain time of day, and you've got your outputs. We want to be taking all of these together. So when we plan a website, have we looked at all of these? Have we ticked all the boxes and said, we're considering content in the context of output and scenarios and different users, and are we modeling appropriate for, appropriately for those end delivery experiences that we want? You don't have to do all this tomorrow. I've got a lot of clients who are banking metadata. They are starting to think in a more structured methodological way because they know that later the system will be capable of leveraging it. This is part of the strategy bit of content strategy. We're, you know, we have to do things as we're, as we're able to execute on today. I'll give you an example. So um, there's a podcast by the Content Marketing Institute. I do, I do a lot of stuff with them. Um, and I did this podcast with them. So now your average podcast, uh, you get on there and you kind of shoot the shit with an with a interviewer for a while, 45 minutes goes by, load, this, load the file up to iTunes, done. The CMI uh, podcast has a structure to it. They have predictable sections of the podcast. So they have obvious stuff like the audio file, who it was, the series theme, and these all exist on the page there. Uh, short description and the contributor. Then they have a section called new, now, and next, a section called blast the buzzword, a Q&A section, book recommendations, and final advice. And most of those sections will appear. The new, now, next are not optional. They're in every interview. And then the others are optional. They may or may not be there. So they have that model. And if they enrich that model, I'll just I'm gonna skip this for time. But the idea is, you've got this model, and if we put keywords on each bit of it, you could automatically assemble from the audio files a podcast which is all about the buzzwords. So what do all the interviewees say about buzzwords? Or about recommended books. We could, comp we could do a recommended books podcast from all of our existing podcasts. Or what's up and coming in the market. Or let the user define something. Let the user say, this is what I'm interested in, and have them return all um, content strategist podcasts from Europe. Why not? The system, once it has that metadata, can pull that all together. And there's no reason that we couldn't reuse some of that information out to um, a print brochure or a catalog when we're speaking at a conference and pull that same data out. So what you're essentially doing is you're writing this love note to the future where you have metadata which you can use sometime when you're ready. They're not ready to do this yet, but they know that someday the system will be able to do it. So they are structuring their content like that now so that they're able to use all that good metadata when their systems are, are caught up. So all doable because of consistency and not so scary semantics. 
So what you should do now, what you should do now, go home and do an omnichannel readiness review or tell your clients that they should do one or they should pay you one to do one for them. Um, look at the people platform positioning. How is content used? How does, the, how does that client understand the role of content in their business? How is that working across channels and platforms? And do they have the people they need to, to do something more intelligent? Audit that state. Build some detailed multi-context journeys and stories. Show how it could be. Consider how you'll measure the success of that. And then do a small conservative scope where you can do a, a minimum viable prototype and say, we want to be able to demonstrate how much value this could add if we do some key strategic changes. Uh, the, the, the impact can be quite substantial. If you're interested in knowing more, I do some, some workshops about this. Um, I've got two coming up, one in New Orleans and one in London. I put this up here not just as a plug, but to invite you and say, what we often do is we run them in your offices. So if you've got offices where we, have, where we could run a workshop, or you have clients who have, uh, might want to have a workshop, we can run it there and invite other people, and then yourselves or the client can invite free people. So if you want to maybe host us doing a workshop, then, then let me know. Thank you very much. Do we have time for, do we have time yeah. for Q&A? We do have time for questions. Um, also, Lars probably won't dare to say it himself, but I know he's having some of his uh, copies of his book with him, so if anybody's interested. Uh, <clears throat> and I actually saw today, because I had to quickly peek to have the exact title, I actually saw that it's temporarily sold out on Amazon, so that's your chance. Anyway, opening up for questions. So the question is, have I ever worked with schema.org directly to influence how they model data on the site? Uh, not as of yet. It's on my, my to-do list. I'm working already with a smaller standards body in a particular niche called uh, DITA. And they're doing something called DITA for marketing and e-commerce right now. And that's very exciting for me because of my background. So I'm, that's kind of all my committee work used up. I can barely keep up with one committee. Committees are as much fun as you think. <laughs> so. The real difference, um, schema.org is a general uh, metadata standard, whereas DITA is actually a modular metadata standard where it defines particular types. So you could define a blog post and define all the bits of a blog post and uh, structure your inline validation rules in DITA. Schema.org tells you, if you do a blog post, write this on it so we know it's a blog post. That's it. It doesn't give you the ability to do all that rich modeling and tell your users what they can do and what they can't do and where to do it, and et cetera. Oh, sorry, can I just, I want to put a very, so my summary of that is schema.org is a publishing standard. DITA is a authoring and management standard. Yes. Yeah, there is a bit of that. So, for example, with ASDA, they blew hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, on visual design, CSS, UX, logo. I never even saw the bloody logo. Like, yeah. The, and why I started this with a content karma message was, in the same way that Tim Berners-Lee, 15 years ago, had to be going around saying, put your content out on the web, people will just find it. And people said, well, I don't want people to just read my content. I want them to talk to my salespeople. I want them to talk to me. I don't want to just have them self-educate and buy online. And he goes, tough. That's where the whole world's going to go. It's kind of the same answer, is that people are going to want those answers. And if you're, if you're the one who's not putting your data out there, then you'll be in the same situation as the people who didn't put their content out on the web. And then I, the only thing I would add to that is, is there some value add that your site can do, which is Google is not? Is there something unique and particular? I don't know what your site does, but there's probably some user experience value add that you can still add, which Google is not going to bother investing in. Different content for different profiles? Yeah. Yeah. 
With technological changes, you said? Challenges. challenges, yes. So technological challenges of doing things like caching for very dynamic websites. Yes, that is a challenge. Um, I am not a developer. So, for example, Jeff Eaton, that might be a good person to, to ask about that because he will have been more tied into the technical side of enablement. I'm working on the strategy side. I'm saying, as an organization, this is what we can do. This is what the benefit is. This is how we get our people to do it. From a technical perspective, that's not really my area to say, how is it going to be load balanced and efficient and all that stuff. I have a question, uh, more like a technical, technical question. There's like two ways to integrate schema.org in, in your web page. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do it in line, like within the HTML. Uh, also, you can use JSON-LD uh, for it and to add it to the head of your body, of your, of your document page. Mm -hmm. uh, is there like a preferred way? Uh, what's better? I don't think there is a preferred way. Um, I, there might be an SEO preferred way. But then you'd uh, probably want to ask an SEO person. Mm -hmm. from, a, from a creation point of view, provided you have a structural model on your storage and input side, it makes no difference because you're going to write it all down to the, to the, to the JSON. Um, or you are going to write it in line. It, it, but it's an automatic process, so it doesn't really matter from, from, a, from a management point of view. So the only, I think the only answer would be net from an SEO perspective. I like inline just because my instinct says it makes more sense, especially if we're compiling that page from various modules. You want each module to have its metadata with it as opposed to treating it as one block. We're getting away from treating anything as one block these days, so I would say that I, for my instinct, inline is better. Cool, thank you. For, for sorry. Right, so prioritize the user rather than the search engine? So what's the question exactly? Oh, right. So when I was showing the, the, the taxonomy, I was prioritizing for the user which part of the content is more important to this kind of user. Yes, yes. You can treat, you treat the search engine as one more audience. So we ha I have in some of my models uh, social. And so the authors have to fill out the social content because they write titles, for example, which are not social friendly. So they have to write the title in the, in the main part of the body, and then they have to write the social title so that when it's shared, it's a social friend, friendly title. And then those things are mapped to that persona effectively. Do you have a, um, do you have a, a tool that you use for modeling content, like a um you know, do you use like Visio or do you use some kind of, yeah, how do you, how do you um, actually model your content? It's an up and coming tool. It's called Excel by a company called Microsoft. <laughs> 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 no, no, I'm serious. <laughs> it really, um, I do a whole another presentation on why this is actually so difficult. And it has to do with the fact that we're, we're giving our content dimensions effectively. There's ways that we could look at it, ways that we could think about it that we couldn't before. So when I'm modeling, I end up using Excel because there's not really a, a tool out there which is kind of designed to allow me to, to look at this model in all the different ways I want to do it. So if I'm exchanging and reviewing with clients, um, if I'm working with other content strategists, Excel just ends up being the, the best of the available options. It's the least of all evils, I'll put it that way, for modeling content. And I, I've got some templates in it which I've been working on for the past couple of years, and so moving to another tool now would be kind of a pain in the butt, too. Do I create more than one model? Oh, absolutely. Sorry. So the question is, are there more than one entity, more than one uh, model in a, in, a, in a website? Yes, absolutely. So there's kind of this content types and then this content model. And I didn't go into all the subtleties here. But actually, the model is several types that have been put together. So we might have a simple type, like um, a feature list. 
or you know, a promo box. And then a model might say, okay, if you have a, uh, a description paragraph, a short description, description paragraph, um, and then a feature list and a promo box, that makes up uh, a landing page. So you have your various different types, which you have their own, 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 and you have rules for how your different types come together, and that overall thing is your content model. So you may have dozens of types. I wouldn't try, I would try to avoid actually having dozens of types. If you can get away with seven, then great. And you don't have to model every little thing that uh, is on the site. You can have, you know, this is a page and it's the about us. We only have one. That we don't need a model. We just write it. So you don't have to model everything. You want to model everything that you're going to process in some fancy way or everything you're going to do a lot of so that they're consistent with each other. Anybody else? Going once, going twice, sold. Thank you very much. <laughs>